So I stumbled across the Endeavor OS about a couple months ago when I was looking for a Linux distribution that is extremely close to Vanilla Arch with the company of a very good installer. Now I needed that because I was making a benchmarking video with Windows, Debian, and Arch or Endeavor and my experience with it was so good that I ended up installing it on my laptop using the XFCE edition which out of the gate for an XFCE edition is absolutely beautiful. And that's one thing Endeavor OS really does well. Their color scheming and everything, it just makes a really, really beautiful Linux distribution. And it includes just enough stuff on it that somebody installing it is gonna have a really, really good experience with it. So in this video, what we're gonna actually be doing is doing a full installation kind of guide on installing Endeavor OS. Uh, and in this case, I'm gonna be using the i3 window manager when we get to that. So if you don't plan on using the i3 window manager, the first half of this video should be good enough to get you into it. But once I do get it installed, I'm gonna be running through tips and tricks within the i3 configuration to kind of get it exactly how you want it. And one of the reasons why I really like their, well, how they have i3 flavored is because for the most part, it's how I would have customized it anyways. And I'm just gonna be showing you some of the little tweaks that I made to make it even a little bit better. So this is the Endeavor OS website. They provide a lot of really good information here and including they had a new release just a little bit ago with some updated packages, better kernel, well not better, but updated kernel and a lot of improvements. So to actually download this thing, you just go up here, download and help. You go over to the latest release, scroll down all the way down. And then you will have links right here where you can download it from their GitHub, torrent it, or any of these other options. Now once you do have it installed, what you're going to want to do is flash it to a USB drive. Now there's a couple different ways you can do this. If you're running on Windows currently, you can use uh, one of two programs that I'd recommend. Either Etcher, Etcher is a great program, you just plug in the USB, select the disk image, and flash it directly to it. Or Rufus is another really good one that basically functions the exact same way. I'm not going to get too into that because it's pretty seamless, it's step by step, it, you, you'll figure it out. If you are on Linux, you can use a number of the tools that come installed on your system, whether if you're in KDE, you can use their KDE Partition Manager, you can use the GNOME Disks tool. If you're looking for something that's really clean, simple, and easy to use, I do recommend Popsicle. It's the ISO flashing tool created by System76, that is a really good one. Or, of course, you could always use Etcher. And those all generally function the exact same way. It's a pretty simple process. But once you do have it burnt to a USB drive, you're going to want to plug it into your computer. Depending on what motherboard you have, you're either going to hit uh, Delete, Escape, F12, F11, F8. There's going to be a key that you hit to get into your motherboard's boot menu. Uh, when you are in the boot menu, usually it flashes real quick when it first starts up, so you'll be able to see what it is. It might take you a couple of boots to get in there. Uh, and then you're going to want to boot to the ISO or the USB drive. And when you do first boot into the USB drive, this is what you're going to see right here. It's kind of blown up right now because it is in a virtual box, but you will have a couple different options. If you are running NVIDIA drivers or a NVIDIA graphics card, you're going to want to boot into the non-free latest drivers. Um, generally, this top one is completely free and open source software. But if you go with this one, it will include the non-free, non-open source software required to use some of those uh, NVIDIA cards, and there's some Wi-Fi cards that may need this. Uh, generally, you could go with this, but if you want to be on the safe side, you could go ahead and boot into this regardless. So what we're going to do for me is select this top one right here and boot on into this. You're going to see a screen that looks like this. It's basically just loading up all the packages and everything it's going to need to get you into that live desktop environment. And then when you first boot in, it's going to look a little something like this. This is your live environment. Right now, you could go ahead and test it out, play with everything. Right now, it's running the XFCE desktop environment by default. And like I said, the XFCE desktop environment, how they have it all themed is absolutely beautiful. And you could go ahead and just install this and be good to go. You will have a great experience. I personally was running this for a number of months and I absolutely loved it. Right here you have a little welcome window. You can start the installer, you can update it. There's a quick section here to change your desktop or your display resolution. You have a partition manager here if you need to go in and actually wipe or actually partition some of the drives on your system. You could go ahead and do that before you even start the installation process. You can see in here I just have one 32 gigabyte drive because this is a virtual machine. 
but when running through this on your actual hardware will be basically the exact same process. Now, if you're on a laptop, now is the time that you're gonna want to try to connect to the Wi-Fi just to make sure that one, it works. And if it doesn't work, I would try booting into the non-free and seeing if that works. I personally have never run into any issues, but I do know some Wi-Fi drivers do have a problem. Well, Wi-Fi cards do have a problem with Linux. So after you've explored this and you played around, what you could do is go ahead and start the installer. If you closed this out, there's a button right here that you could use to install the system as well. But I'm just going to click start the installer. And here is where you're going to want to choose your method. Now the offline method is going to install this XFCE desktop just how it is. Uh, if you like how it looks, you like XFCE, and if you're even coming over from Windows, I would recommend it, because overall it's great and it's going to be a very similar experience to how Windows works. If you want to install any other desktop environments through this actual installer, you're going to want to go with the online method and make sure you actually do have an internet connection. So it's going to open up a terminal here, and this is just a visualization of what is going on on the back end with this installer. So here, we're going to go through the installation process. For me, I'm going to select American English, and then select my time zone. I am in the Pacific Standard Time Zone. Thankfully, I'm not close to Los Angeles. I'm going to go ahead and go next. You're going to want to pick your keyboard layout by default. It detects it pretty good, but I am the English US keyboard layout. And from here, we're going to go ahead and erase the entire disk. Now, I highly recommend one you back up everything onto a different drive because you're going to lose everything if you don't do that uh, a lot of people are going to want to dual boot one thing i would really recommend is to only install one linux distribution on one drive if you have windows and linux dual booting on the same drive or even linux and another linux distro dual booting on the same drive you could run into issues in general it is just best practice to install one operating system on one drive and when we select this you see that there is an option to have swap uh, I do swap to file generally what swap is well the swap to file will create a file on your system that will load some stuff into that normally would have been in your system RAM this is really good especially if you have a lower amount of RAM if you have eight or less I would highly recommend you set up swap I'm not going to get too into that, I'll leave a link in the description if you'd like to learn more about swap, but setting up a swap to file, especially if you have a hard drive with enough room, is just a good thing to do. Then if you go down, you see a little checkbox here that says encrypt system. What this will do is actually encrypt the hard drive, and you'll have to enter in a passphrase every time your system is booted to unlock the hard drive. Uh, if you're really concerned about security, or if you have really, really either confidential or very private things on your computer, uh, it might be a good thing to go ahead and do. And then down here you have your bootloader selection. I recommend just keeping this at default. Uh, if you actually know how to do this, you're, you know how to do it. For most people, just keep this at default. And we're going to go to the next section. And this is your package selection. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that this first one is always checked. This is a lot of really, really important packages to make sure your system runs fine. And this is one of the reasons why an Arch installer like this is really good, because it will go ahead and pull all of these packages that a lot of them you would have had to go get manually yourself. And you could go through here and actually see if there's something you don't want and uncheck it, such as like HTOP, for example. You could uncheck that uh, as NeoFetch, so you can uncheck that. Uh, little programs that you know what they are, you could go ahead and deselect. But generally, I do recommend you just keeping everything as is, because everything in there is useful. Now here is when we're going to go ahead and select our i3 window manager because that is what I want to be installing. And I'm also going to go with printing support and support for HD printers. You might as well install that just in case. If you don't want to go with the i3 window manager and for example let's say you're coming over from Windows, I would recommend either installing this using the offline installer like we talked about which will go with the XFCE. But also Mate, KDE, Cinnamon, Bungie are all good desktop environments, especially if you're coming over from Windows. GNOME is a little bit different, and if you're not familiar with it, it, there's a slight learning curve, but it is a beautiful desktop environment as well. And if your system specifications are really low, I would take a look at the LXQT desktop. So that said, we're going to go ahead and select these packages and go to next. And here you're going to want to set up your users. So I'm going to give myself the na uh, name of Brandon. Your username, Brandon, you're going to want to give your computer a name. It might have a bunch of weird numbers here. Generally, like on my laptop, I have this just named as like ThinkPad and then the model number. So I have a ThinkPad T450. That's one example. 
But for this, I'm just gonna call this VB because this is a virtual machine. And now you're gonna to wanna to give it a password that you will not forget. So I'm gonna type that in there. And then you have two options here, log in automatically without asking for a password. So this is basically the opposite of encrypting your hard drive. Basically you turn on your computer and you're in. Personally, I don't recommend you do that, but if your computer, you think your computer is gonna be fine, you could do whatever you wanna do. But I do recommend you use the same password for the admin account. So if you need to do any sudo, commands to install programs, you could just use this password here. If you want to be really safe, you could undo that and then set a different password for the administrator account. But I'm going to use same, hit next, it's going to give us a summary of everything that's going to happen. And then we're going to go ahead and click install, install now. So we can see back here it working, you could go ahead and watch this so you can see step by step what it's actually doing behind the scenes. But I will be back when this is all done. All right, so now it is all done. This is what it'll look like. You go ahead and check this restart now box. Uh, you can go ahead and play around more in here if you would like to, but we're just gonna hit done. And then at this point, you would want to unplug that USB from your computer just to make sure that it doesn't boot into it and you get a whole boot cycle thing going on. So now what we're gonna do is go ahead and boot into our fresh install of Endeavor OS and run through some little uh, pointers with i3 that you may want to consider. So now we are booted into the system and the very first thing that you will see is a little dialog box like this which runs through some tasks that you can do after you go ahead and install your system. I do recommend you go through all of these as this is actually a really really good guide. The first thing is update your mirrors so what that will do is it will check all the different servers to see which ones are the quickest for you as far as updates, packages, things like that. And then you go ahead and update your system clean up packages, change your display manager, which I would recommend you keep that the same for now. You could change your display resolution, so if you click on that, you do have a little dialog here. I'm just gonna set that and quit it because that is what I need to run for this virtual machine. And I will note, I did go ahead and boot into this a little bit ago so I could install the VirtualBox drivers because that was essential, so this didn't look like it was a 400 by 400 resolution. But for now, we could hit see you later, or if you don't want this to pop up again, just do don't show me anymore, so see you later. And now this is i3. So one of the reasons I like i3 is it is very, very handy when it comes to just general system and task management. It's super clean. And like I said earlier, I do like how they already have a lot of the i3 configuration files set up. So for example, if I open up uh, additional workspaces, you can see that they already are using emoticons. It's set up really nice. So if I go Windows key N, that's gonna open up the default file explorer in the third workspace so you can see it's right here if i go window n it'll open it again i could go window v and then window n which will change it to the vertical format go ahead and close this out this isn't really a full tutorial on key bindings i will have a link in the description if you need to learn i3 but what i do want to show you is some things that i needed to change and fix especially when it comes to on my laptop so I'm gonna put NeoFetch over here just kind of as a placeholder. And one thing you do notice, so actually I'm gonna open up the i3 config. And one thing you may notice is with how these terminals are set up at 100% transparency, if you have a background that is lighter in nature, this may not look good. So to change this, you just wanna right click on a terminal, go over to preferences. And then from here, we could go to appearance and we could change the opacity down a little bit. So maybe about there. And what I like to do is actually kind of follow that purple color scheme they're going with. So for the background color, I'm gonna go ahead and select a purple. So maybe this one, select. Ah, uh, it's a little too bright, so let's go with this darker one here. Select, and we are looking good. Maybe a little, little darker. So right about there, that's kind of my uh, general preference when it comes to the terminal colors. So that's one thing you may not like, the 100% uh, transparency, and that's how you change that. So now with that, one thing you may have noticed, if we go ahead and open up, for example, our file explorer again we can see down here it did open up but it didn't go to that window and that's because by default they don't have the focus set to automatically go there I personally like that so to change that what you're gonna want to do is go down to the workspace behaviors which is down here so the configuration for workspace behavior and this is where you can actually go ahead and change how these are named you can see by default the first one is the little terminal symbol then we have Firefox folder the at symbol as an email and then a chat client there. And here's where you could go ahead and change the default applications for this. What I was just talking about with the focus window, this is what you're gonna to wanna to look for right here, the automatic set focus new window opens in another workspace. So if I just go ahead and actually take off this little uh, pound symbol here, 
go ahead and save this. So control O, enter. And then we're gonna to want to restart i3. So that's just the uh, window key, shift and R. So that will go ahead and restart that. So now if we go back to workspace one, well actually let's go back to workspace three, close this out. And then if we go back to workspace one, we see it disappears. Now if we go ahead and go Windows key N to open that up, you can see that now it will automatically shift to the workspace in which the new window has opened. So now if we go back here, we have some more options. For example here, I don't use Thunderbird, I use Mailspring, so I don't have the application installed quite yet, but I could just go ahead and change this to Mailspring. If you do actually want to find a class for a window, you're just gonna to wanna to go into a terminal and type xprop, and then we'll see that the little uh, cursor here changes into kind of a crosshair. And then if we go ahead and click on a window, it will give us all of that class information that we're gonna need. So if we go down here under the WM protocols or WM class right here, this is the input that you're gonna want to use to put in here to properly name the application. One other thing I'd like to bring up that's more laptop specific that I ran into an issue is if we go up to the key bindings, or down from where we were, so the key bindings, so key binding different actions, we have the backlight control. This is the brightness, if you're on a laptop, there should be a button on your keyboard to change the brightness. Uh, I couldn't get this to work to save my life, so if I go over here and I type x backlight, x backlight, which is the actual command that it's gonna run, you can see the command is not found. So you're gonna to want to make sure that is installed. Once you do install it, then this will begin to work. And you could just install that, yay, x backlight, hit enter, and then it will bring up some packages. We just go with the first one, type in your password, continue with the installation. And now if you're on a laptop, these key bindings will actually begin to work. Also, plus and minus 10 is kind of a lot, so it's gonna be really hard to get like the perfect brightness with that. So I would change this to five, just so instead of one out of 10, you have uh, 20 different uh, settings to be specific. And for the most part, that's really all the settings I had to change to get it exactly how I wanted it, other than switching out some more of these applications for things I use, like Mailspring. I switched this out for uh, Discord. I switched this out for LibreWolf. And generally, everything else is fairly customized to my specific preferences. Now, if I go down to the starting on, well, the auto start applications on startup, just somewhere in here, one thing that I did was installed uLauncher. Now, this has dmenu by default, which is actually a good application for uh, just starting applications. And you can set scripts and do all kinds of things with this. But for a window manager, I really like uLauncher. I just like the look of it. I like how uh, theming and some of the extensions that you could do. And to uh, start that up, because by default it won't start. So here you just do an execute command and then you type in uh, uLauncher after you have that installed and then it will actually start up when your system starts up or when i3 resets. So that's really all I'm going to get into when it comes to the i3 kind of configuration tips that I have. I'm not an expert with i3 quite yet. If you're interested in learning more about i3, I'll have a link down in the, the description to the videos that I've used to kind of learn i3 to the extent that I currently know it. But you did hear me talk about uLauncher, and I'm actually going to have a video coming up uh, in the next couple days going over uLauncher. So that is about it as far as my tips. And OS is becoming probably my favorite Linux distribution. And you're probably going to see within the next couple weeks that I'm going to probably switch my main system from Manjaro to Endeavor OS, as well as switching over to the wonderful world of window managers. If you've never used a window manager before, I do have a video going over Cronkite, which is an awesome KWIN extension for KDE Plasma. It's a pretty good introduction to window managers, and if you want to go a step beyond that, i3 is probably the better window manager if you are a noob in that regard like myself. Other than that, I do hope you have a very good day. Please subscribe, ring the bell so you don't miss new content like this one. Don't forget to like this video. Have a beautiful day and goodbye.